Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Heidi Stroud Watts in Sydney. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. I'm Annabelle Droolers in Hong Kong and the top stories this hour. Asian stocks set for a positive open ahead of the US inflation data. A big tech rally driving the S&P 500 within a whisk of record highs, while bond yields fall. Beijing blasts the US move to hike tariffs on about $18 billion of imports after President Biden accuses China of cheating on trade. And I'm Paul Allen at Parliament House in Canberra, where the Albanese government has handed down a budget that tries to balance cost of living relief against not stoking inflation. We'll dissect the plan with Finance Minister Katie Gallagher shortly. And in Singapore, I'm Avril Hong, reporting live as the country's fourth leader since independence prepares to take power. We'll look at the unprecedented challenges facing the new Prime Minister, Lawrence Wong. All right, counting down to the market opens here across Asia. At the start of the day, you've got U.S. futures coming online fairly steady, but in the context of what was another run-up in the prior session. So the S&P 500 just within a few points of reaching a, a new fresh record high. Tesla, Nvidia among some of the big gainers there. Also that enthusiasm and the optimism around mean stocks continued for another session. You had GameStop, for instance, that's the last close you're seeing there, but up 60% adding to those gains of around 70% the day prior as well. A few different eco points to note because we had producer price inflation data coming out, actually topping economists' forecasts here. When you look beneath the surface, there were a couple of different details that did offer some relief in key categories there, and we can get more details on that in just a moment. And, of course, Heidi, uh, hearing from Jay Powell as well, another focus for the session. Yeah, big focus ahead of, of course, inflation prints. That PPI number uh, really causing that reversal when it comes to expectations that maybe the data is softening because inflation, at least on the producer price front, is still looking very sticky. So we're really watching uh, what the consumer price inflation number has to hold. That's a major narrative that we're watching now. Uh, futures looking like we'll see a little bit of a move upwards when it comes to the start of trading in Sydney, which is about uh, 50 minutes away there uh, from the start of cash trading. Kiwi stocks a little bit on the the back foot already this morning. Nikkei futures uh, looking sort of mildly positive. So we will see that follow through when it comes to the US rally, it seems watching the tech stocks, given that we did see big tech mega caps leading that recovery in US benchmarks as well ahead of that key inflation number. Uh, China futures looking a little bit softer at this point. A number of closed markets to contend with today, namely Hong Kong and Korea, both closed on account of the Buddha's birthday holiday. But of course, uh, one of the big challenges, uh, despite the fact that we haven't really seen much of a market reaction, is of course how we digest these uh, tariffs. Are they significant when it comes to the substance? It's more sort of political posturing going into November. Take a listen to what we heard from President Biden and the U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai. I want fair competition with China, not conflict. When you make tactics like these, uh, they are, they're, they're, you're not competing. It's not competition. It's cheating. And we've seen damage here in America. We are interested to see uh, how China responds. Um, we have indicated to China that this is not a, an intention to escalate. Uh, or even to confront, it really is on our side, um, a set of defensive measures when taken together with the investments that we are making here in uh, green and clean technology. Well, China has blasted the Biden administration's move in a statement, vowing to take its own action, but it's yet to reveal any concrete response. Our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, joins us now for more. And Steve, uh, we knew this was coming and, and, and there's a range of different sectors here that are in focus. But what really stands out to you? Yeah, I mean, we've known this since Friday with the Bloomberg scoop, uh, and then now it's fleshed out with the details and the announcement. So everybody knew this was coming, and I'm sure it was well telegraphed as well uh, by U.S. officials to Beijing with the various trips by U.S. officials uh, that something like this was potentially coming down. Keep in mind, this is the culmination of about a two-year review of Trump-era tariffs on China. And keep in mind as well, none of those tariffs were rolled back. Right. So they were added on to uh, and in key areas, as we just heard from Catherine Tai and also Joe Biden, in key areas that are key to China's uh, ramp up of manufacturing capacity and in the industrial base at a time of a slowing domestic economy. So we're talking their th new three EVs, batteries, solar, as well as chips and other things, everything from ship 
shipped to shore. Cranes are added to, uh, you know, an increase of 25%. Syringes and needles, 50%. Surgical gloves, 25%. So there's a lot of different products, targeted products, as Janet Yellen has talked about, uh, against China and the increase of these tariffs. Yellen, by the way, uh, she also weighed in on this, saying this will not cause a meaningful rise in U.S. prices. And that's the big concern, obviously, that this could stoke inflation if you're uh, raising uh, the import costs potentially on a lot of these products. Here's the statement uh, coming from the Ministry of Commerce, MOFCOM, in Beijing. China will take resolute measures to safeguard its own rights and interests. The U.S. should immediately correct its wrong action and cancel the additional measures against China. Beijing also adding that the tariffs were political manipulation ahead of the November election. Obviously, this is something that Donald Trump has weighed in on. He says, forget the 100% increase on EV tariffs into the United States. It should be 200%. Of course, Donald Trump has talked a lot about, across the board, 60% tariffs on Chinese products. So it's going to get interesting, obviously, over the next six months. Now, the big question right now is, what can China do to retaliate? We, we don't know. And what is their capacity to retaliate, perhaps on their own export controls, like on key minerals, which China controls. Uh, but again, that could undermine Xi Jinping's uh, efforts to restore confidence in its domestic economy and also attract uh, investment from abroad. So we'll see. A lot of been said about, uh, say, how nuanced uh, these tariffs were, and there's some pretty key exclusions and, and careful exclusions here. Yeah, the U.S. solar industry, for one, has has argued, and I guess rightfully, not rightfully so, but uh, uh, it's been justified, I guess, by the USTR, the U.S. Trade Representative's Office and Catherine Tai, essentially starting a process for the exclusion, perhaps, of about 19 different products, essentially for equipment that goes into making solar components, uh, because that solar industry in the United States, it's 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 up and coming, but it's not there yet. And that could, if we raise the, if the United States raises the price on the solar equipment, um, manufacturing equipment, essentially could raise their costs and, and, and hinder their efforts to build out their own supply chain in the solar industry. In particular, uh, the U.S. manufacturers, they're arguing about tariffs on solar ingot and also wafer making equipment uh, that would raise their costs at all. But keep in mind as well, something that was interesting that I read through this, on those EV batteries and the lithium-ion batteries, yes, the, the Biden administration raised the tariffs on lithium-ion batteries for EVs to 50%, but they did not raise the tariffs for lithium-ion batteries that go into solar uh, equipment. And that is a key uh, designation as well, not to hinder uh, the burgeoning U.S. solar industry, which is, of course, really dominated by China, overwhelmingly dominated by China. All right, Steve, that was our Chief North Asia correspondent there, Stephen Engel. And just a few breaking lines to note here this morning. We do have some leadership changes or uh, resignation, rather, at OpenAI. Uh, this is, of course, the company that, that brought ChatGPT into the world. But Ilya Sutskeva is leaving the company. He's actually just put a post out on X and saying that after almost more than a decade, he's made the decision to leave OpenAI. Uh, the company's trajectory has been nothing short of miraculous, he says. But he is, uh, as we said, exiting the company. It has been a, a very interesting period, of course, for OpenAI. Sutskever is actually one that voted to oust uh, Sam Altman as CEO, but then managed to survive all of that leadership tumult and, and was appointed to the board. But uh, Sutskever is saying he's very excited for what comes next. And it's a project that is something that's quite meaningful to him personally, Heidi. Australia's government has delivered a second consecutive budget surplus, but its spending plan will see a return to deficit in the next fiscal year as the country heads towards an election. Treasurer Jim Chalmers says the fiscal blueprint will help ease cost of living pressures without stoking inflation. This budget shows that we are realistic about the pressures that people face right now, and we are optimistic about the future. This budget reflects our biggest ambitions and our highest aspirations to make Australians the primary beneficiaries of a world of churn and change. Bloomberg's Paul Allen is at Parliament House in Canberra this morning. Uh, Paul, it's the without stoking inflation part that's uh, got a big question mark over it, right? What do you point to when it comes to the disappearance of surpluses? 
Yeah, surplus, we barely knew ye. Uh, 9.3 billion Aussie dollars, that's about <laughs> 6.1 billion US dollars. And that's pretty much locked in because there's just a few weeks left in the financial year. But then, yes, we're back into deficits, 18.7 billion for 2024-25, and that's double what economists were expecting. So where did it go? How did it evaporate so quickly? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, commodity prices are forecast to come down. Uh, the iron ore price forecast to be $60 per tonne over the next year, although the, the budget forecasts for iron ore are typically pretty conservative. But forecasts for coal thermal, metallurgical coal, natural gas as well, they've been dialed back as well. And then there's the spending side of the equation. $26 billion in tax cuts, everyone is going to get a tax cut. $300 billion worth of energy bill relief, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, everyone's getting that as well. And then there are uh, expansion of the rental assistance plan, $330 billion in spending on defence, and uh, also we've got uh, the Future Made in Australia plan, which we've been talking about extensively. That's $27 billion, although that cost is going to be spread out over the course of a decade. So, hey presto, your surplus has evaporated. <laughs> and Paul, of, of course, we're getting closer, I guess, to the election that's going to be held next year. So is this a, is this a budget that has that vote very much in mind? Yeah, that's a question I'll be putting to the Finance Minister, Katie Gallagher, a little bit later on this hour. And I am anticipating a coy answer, naturally, because one of the benefits of incumbency is getting to choose when the election is going to be. And in that regard, you want to keep your opponents guessing. But I boil it down to a fairly simple equation. If CPI comes down, plus the RBA eases later this year, that equals an early election, potentially. Now, that's the great hope here, is that this government has delivered cost of living relief without stoking inflation. Now, that's a point of some debate between both the government, the opposition, economists as well. Uh, BI, Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg Analytics, has also published a note saying, well, this is going to push back rate cuts, all this additional spending. Uh, for its part, the Treasury is forecasting inflation to be at 2.75 per cent by year end. That's back within the RBA's target range, and that would open the door to potential rate cuts. However, that's 12 months earlier than the RBA forecasts for inflation to be back in target range. Now, both of these groups, the Treasury, the RBA, they're meant to be apolitical. So there's a pretty obvious disconnect here on inflation forecasts. Paul well, Allen there in Canberra. We'll have more analysis on Australia's budget uh, coming up with Paul. And Finance Minister Katie Gallagher will be joining us later this hour. We'll be speaking with the Shadow Treasurer Angus Taylor as well later on. Coming up, Evans and Partners sharing their investment strategy as Fed Chair Jay Powell suggests rates might be kept higher for longer. The Middle East and Africa. Vibrant resources and high yield investment opportunities abound. Join me on Horizon Middle East and Africa for the stories, newsmakers, and insight from this exciting region. Now, we say only on Bloomberg. I don't think that it's likely, based on the data that we have, that, that the next move that we make would be a rate hike. Uh, I think it's more likely that we'll be at a place where we hold the policy rate where it the is. The first quarter in the United States was notable for its lack of further progress on inflation. We had uh, higher readings in the first quarter and um, higher than we expected. We did not expect this to be a smooth road, but these were higher than I think anybody expected. And so what that has told us is that we'll need to be patient and let restrictive policy do its work. Fed Chair Jerome Powell on the central bank's fight against inflation. Of course, we'll get a little bit more when we get uh, that inflation picture uh, being rounded out by the consumer numbers later on. Let's bring on XS Lucy Mayer, who's a senior investment advisor at Evans and Partners, here with us in Sydney. And of course, this kind of balance between uh, fiscal and monetary is, is a challenge for the Fed. It's increasingly now front and centre for the RBA as well. When you take a look at the budget announcement, subsidies for all, if you're an electricity user, it seems. Um, how much does that complicate the picture? Well, the government's been at pains to sort of really assess that they've worked with Treasury to work out the potential inflationary impacts of these measures. And they, you know, assure us that they aren't to be 
um, you know, too considerate. But I think their main objective here was looking at the, the health of the consumer, which has been certainly dire. You know, the cost of living um, has been very stressful for consumers and, and we calculate that to be in aggregate at $150 billion for 2023 was that aggregate measure. And that's looking at things, you know, rising interest rates, cost of living and inflation um, and also tax bracket creep. So these measures from the from the budget and from the government go some way to address those concerns. As you mentioned, we saw the energy subsidy, $300 to all households who use electricity um, in combination with those tax cuts. And we've also seen some rent relief. Um, so they really are at pains to try and provide um, some relief to those cost of living pressures. Um, and and we'll, we'll see how that goes. For you, though, there are some investable themes coming out of the support that we've seen in the budgets and the critical minerals announcements, healthcare. Are you able to act those in terms of the companies that you see a clear benefit pass through? Yeah, well, as you mentioned, so healthcare, there were some um, net benefits to pathologists, so players like Helios, Australian Clinical Labs, um, they should see some benefit from indexation, which we haven't seen in 25 years, so that is is, is a benefit, probably not a, an extremely large one. Um, also, the critical minerals play through the um, Future in Australia Now project, um, where we're seeing um, incentives and tax um, cuts for producers in critical minerals, so today we might see an uplift from mineral resources, Linus Rare Earths um, and also West Farmers and their significant lithium um, play there. But all of these are sort of at the margin and we'll need to see how things play through. Um, out from where we're sitting, the biggest um, advantage from these budget measures, as well as other reasons to believe um, that c the consumer would improve, are those listed discretionary retailers, um, where we do think that there'll be a lift from these budget measures, as well as we're just seeing, you know, we're seeing rates peaking, um, inflation should be peaking and all of these things will help to increase that per capita consumption that we've seen has been really um, depressed in the last few quarters. Are there any listed discretionary retailers that stand out to you in particular? Yeah, so when we look at the discretionary retailers, I mean, Flight Centre is one that you know, despite COVID and the impact that that had on, on you know, lockdowns and, and restrictions to travel, it actually emerged from that period a, a better business. Um, it brought its cost, cost of um, operations down as it closed a lot of its fixed store, physical stores. So it's actually in a really great position to take advantage of um, the uplift in spending that we're actually seeing from that demographic 60 and above. Um, so we know that this impact on cost of living hasn't been equal across the board. Um, so, yeah, so, so Flight Centre is in a great um, position there as well. We've also seen um, a decline in international airfares at last. Um, so for Flight Centre, who's somebody who's, who packages um, travel offerings together, that means that reduced spend on, on airfares should actually see um, customers able to add on things like cruises and hotels, which are of higher margin to their business. So that's one in the discretionary um, retailer space that we like. You know, others... Um, uh, others there are Premier Investments, really quality business with their international brands like Smiggle, um, Peter Alexander, another high quality domestic brand looking for um, uh, international expansion. And those discretionary retailers, they have done particularly well in the last couple of months, but still um, a lot of them are priced on a PE basis below the market as a whole. So we see opportunity there, particularly if we continue to see strength in that consumer um, throughout this year. I noticed that when you've got uh, flights and you've also got trip.com and, and, and that's of course a play on the Chinese consumer but what's interesting in China at the moment is that we're seeing more people are taking trips and we're sort of recovering there but the, the, the average spend per trip is still pre-pandemic levels. So are you concerned about that and, and what are you thinking about Chinese consumers generally? Well, the Chinese consumer has definitely been a concern and been under pressure, and a lot of that is around confidence levels in the local economy there, you know, across the share market and particularly the property market. And, yes, that's had an impact on trip. We've also seen that thesis play out really well um, this year, so whether there's a lot more to go in that stock, um, we're sort of happy to hold on to that there rather than add to new positions. Um, but back to the consumer, it, it's really interesting because we're seeing, you know, the Politburo has come out and said that potentially they might might add support um, for the property market and that would be through buying excess inventory, excess imp um, apartments um, in China, which would, if they 
sort of set a floor in the in the property market as well as providing stimulus as they have to date in the stock market that could really be a turnaround um, for the confidence in the in the Chinese consumer locally um, in our view which would be quite remarkable so where do we look from there if we get that confidence back in the Chinese consumer then we very well may look to recipients of that um, based offshore so one example that we've been looking at is, is Lululemon so they're a Canadian athleisure brand and um, we've already seen their revenues from China increase 67% um, year on year so we're already seeing growth out of China and if we to your point get that rebound in in consumer confidence in China then they would be ways to play that um, from an offshore perspective. Lucy always great to chat with you here Lucy Mayer Senior Investment Advisor at Evans and Partners. More to come here on Daybreak Australia this is Bloomberg. It is the end of an era in Singapore as Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong prepares to step down after two decades. He's handing power to 51-year-old Lawrence Wong, who's set to face a growing list of economic and geopolitical challenges. Bloomberg's Avril Hong is in Singapore for more details. And so, Singapore, it is truly, uh, Avril, I should say, it is truly the end of an era, right? This has been such a carefully calibrated uh, handover, but that doesn't sort of dismiss the, the, the laundry list of challenges and uh, policy priorities. That's right. And this has been a really well-telegraphed leadership transition, but challenges abound for this new leader who's unpraised for his leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. Challenges such as a more diverse electorate that might be demanding higher degree of transparency, accountability, especially in the wake of a corruption scandal which saw a top minister charged with graft. On top of that, concerns related to housing affordability, wealth and income inequality. The incoming leader has pledged to boost social safety nets and all this coming ahead of a election that needs to take place by November 2025 that some say could come as soon as this year. And this is against the backdrop of the ruling party share of the popular vote sliding over the years. So this could be the first key test for the incoming leader. And externally, challenges abound as well. Think about the US-China relationship, especially as we see the two major trading partners for Singapore going toe-to-toe -to -toe over tariffs. Remember, his foreign policy credentials haven't quite been tested yet. And as one political observer put it, uh, we haven't quite seen his political policy path, that vision being articulated yet for Singapore. So these are the challenges for the new leader. Yeah, and Avril, as you said, very well telegraphed, but, but still, uh, what sort of changes will we see, if any, after the election, like, next year? Right, so what we're seeing now is, I think, that message of policy continuity and stability, that is the Singapore way. So as to whether we'll see changes after the election, uh, that seems to be something that is yet to be determined. But for the moment, we've seen how Lawrence Wong has, for example, opted to keep the cabinet of his predecessor largely intact. So he will have the old guard, so to speak, by his side. He also has uh, the outgoing prime minister in a senior minister role. So tapping on the political influence and his network here, uh, that should stand the leadership in good stead in years to come. Mm -hmm. All right, April Hong there in Singapore for us. More ahead.
Counting down to the market opens here in Sydney, Seoul and Tokyo. At the start of the day here, quite a bit of positivity coming across the screen. It does follow the US session overnight and we continue to see the S&P 500 trending high here. So just within a whisker of reaching a fresh record high, you had big tech giants that were leading the gains there, the likes of Tesla, Nvidia, but meme stocks as well, uh, continuing to see traders piling into the likes of GameStop up around 60%. AMC Entertainment, another one as well. Uh, futures so far for, for the US, a little changed here. But again, a couple of things you're tracking in the session today. Australia, it's very much that budget that's in focus here. We're seeing more spending coming through as the government prepares for an election next year. They have spent the first two years in office really trying to rein that in to try and contain inflation. Some of the economists we're speaking to are saying that the inflationary impulses from that budget are contained or restrained, uh, but others are uh, perhaps a little bit more concerned concerned by that. Not just, of course, that inflation focus in Australia. It's, it's a global theme, naturally, but, but Powell as well speaking about that overnight uh, in Amsterdam, actually, saying that the Fed is likely to keep rates higher for, for longer, again, against the backdrop of inflation pressures in the US. So we had PPI overnight, for instance, coming in hotter than expected. Uh, we do actually have the US inflation print CPI reading coming out today. Uh, the expectation for that one is we're actually going to have seen a moderation over the course of April for the first time in six months. So that would offer some relief to investors. And again, that's perhaps why you're already seeing that sort of run up. Uh, what else we're tracking? Let's take a look at what's happening in the currency space this morning. Uh, really keeping an eye on a different number of themes here today. But broadly, you've got the dollar gauge trending fairly steady here. You are just seeing, again, a bit of dollar strength being reflected against some of those G10 counterparts. Continuing to track Heidi, that Japanese yen there above or getting close to that one 57 level. Take a look at morning calls ahead of the Asia Trading Day. Bank of America says Japan will probably use its U.S. Treasury holdings in any future yen intervention with implications for debt markets. Strategists say reduced demand for Treasuries may push rates up modestly and tighten spreads on the secured overnight financing rate. BFA says Japan may have already spent tens of billions of dollars in official deposits when it stepped in on two occasions in recent weeks to bolster the yen. Uh, watching commodities as well, Carlisle's Jeff Curry is still bullish on oil ahead of the key summer driving season in the US. He told us more when it comes to his outlook for crude. When we think about the underlying demand, you know, it's not spectacular like it is in copper, but it's rock solid. You know, it's well above long term average growth rates. You're going into the gasoline driving season, jet fuel. And by the way, remember, global warming means your cooling season is going to create more demand in the past. Um, we didn't build inventory. So that three Q bull story is still very much intact. Take a look at what we're watching when it comes to trading in oil at the moment. Crude really still kind of seeing uh, some declines. U.S. inflation data, of course, still that question mark when it comes to uh, the stubbornly high uh, elevated levels of producer price inflation that we saw. We are seeing a bit of decline there when it comes to uh, trading uh, in the overnight session. But th that recovery of about six tenths of one percent there when it comes to New York crude, we're now back above $78 uh, barrel there. But certainly producer prices rising more than projected the key components that feed into the preferred inflation gauge though a little bit more muted but we did hear from uh, Jay Powell that the Fed must wait for further evidence that inflation continues to cool so really doubling down on this narrative of staying higher for longer at the Fed we'll also be looking of course to the consumer price data due out on Wednesday for further clues on what that policy trajectory could look like but we have seen crude really trading within that narrow band this week uh, ahead of that data release. And we also had the Bloomberg reporting that OPEC plus producers want their output capacity upgraded in a review. Watching iron ore here as well, of course, as the tariff sort of battle and to and fro between China and the US heats up there as well. We are seeing uh, iron ore over the past couple of sessions really extending those declines. Singapore pricing off by about a quarter of 1%. We saw a major Chinese developer default, of course, earlier this week really further signs that the debt crisis within the uh, the, the very steel intensive property sector uh, is far from being fully played out. More ahead here on Daybreak Australia, this is Bloomberg.
we're in the thick of Japanese earnings season, but a couple of names really standing out to this. And one of those, of course, is Nomura. We've got the company unveiling plans to almost double its profit by the end of the decade. But let's cross over to Tokyo, where our Asia investing editor, Russell Ward, is standing by with our next guest. Good morning. I'm joined by Christopher Wilcox, head of the wholesale division at Nomura Holdings, for an exclusive interview. Christopher, welcome back to Bloomberg. Thanks for having me. I'd like to start by uh, talking about the Investor Day that, ha that Nomura held yesterday. Um, what was the feedback you got from shareholders? So uh, yesterday, obviously, we went through uh, both uh, some of our short-term plans, which we normally do at Investor Day. But this year, we really wanted to also uh, give uh, uh, analysts and investors a feel for uh, the longer-term plans for the business, of which we uh, have some very ambitious plans. I think the feedback was, was positive. As always, there are questions around uh, certain parts of it. Uh, everybody would like us to go uh, faster in terms of uh, uh, increasing the ROE that we have, but our focus is to build a very solid foundation for the firm uh, and, and then build from there to our more ambitious targets in 2030. Uh, I would say that you know some of the themes uh, around the business, obviously uh, some of the themes that we have in Japan around our wealth management business and the Mura Trust Bank were front and central, some of the uh, 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 the theme around uh, uh, building a platform business uh, and then uh, also within the wholesale business and across the firm uh, part of the ambition is to is to change our business mix uh, move ourselves towards more uh, less capital intensive businesses uh, both inside the wholesale business and across the group uh, as a whole uh, and and have a lot of discipline around capital allocation within the firm so I think you know People, the feedback was people were, were uh, feeling that we were saying all of the right things. I think the feedback was positive. Uh, uh, but obviously, always uh, people want us to go quicker and faster right. uh, to the goals. So probably the biggest goal uh, that was announced yesterday was the goal to almost double uh, pre-tax profit uh, by the end of the decade. And part of that what goal uh, involves um, making the wholesale division self-funding and also to allocate resources to other growth areas. Can you explain what that means in practice for the wholesale division? Sure. I, I think, you know, uh, there seems to have been a lot of attention to this particular topic. But what we're really saying uh, is that we're going to think very carefully about the uh, the way in which we use capital across the different businesses in the firm. So, so obviously, uh, the wholesale business is a big revenue generator for the firm. Uh, what we're really saying is that as a proportion of the capital that's deployed across all the businesses in the firm over the next five to seven years, it's unlikely that the wholesale business will take a higher percentage. But what we're really trying to explain with the self-funding piece is that doesn't mean that the wholesale business is going to shrink it doesn't mean that we're going to stop investing in those businesses. We are. We're going to keep investing in those businesses. And the mechanism for doing that is, is through retained earnings. Uh, so the self-funding is really simply saying something that's evidently always true, uh, but we're sort of formalizing it a little bit more, uh, that, that the wholesale business's growth in terms of its uh, financial resources is going to be financed through retained earnings from the profits that the business uh, generates. And that, that creates an incentive structure for... Uh, the wholesale business to 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 grow its profitability and to focus uh, on the higher margin, uh, less resource intensive businesses, which is part part of the goal here. Uh, it aligns interests across across the group, um, and it also uh, but it also reassures both uh, investors and employees that we're going to continue in, to invest in those businesses. So another goal that you uh, mentioned in your presentation was to uh, cut the uh, uh, cost to income ratio to 80% uh, over the medium term uh, or towards the end of the decade uh, from more than 90% now. How do you plan to do that without um, sacrificing revenue growth? Uh, so we've already done a lot of uh, cost reductions. So I think at last year's Investor Day, we committed to making $150 million uh, worth of cost cuts directly inside the wholesale business. Uh, we've exceeded that target. Uh, by the end of this year, we think we'll actually have delivered about $250 million uh, there, is, there are more efficiencies to come. Uh, we globalized our business uh, over the last uh, 15 months or so, which has allowed us to eliminate a lot of uh, duplication and also, I think, give a much uh, cleaner and uh, better face to our clients, many of whom are also global. Uh, so, so I think there's still a lot to do. Obviously, there are some uh, uh, cost efficiencies that can be done quickly, and those are the ones that we've done so far. And then there are some that 
require a little bit more structural change or require uh, technology investment. And, and those, those are things that we're going to continue to work on going forward. And, and there are bigger issues like location strategy and things like that. But I think uh, our cost income ratio has been too high. And in part, that's been our structure, which we've been changing. In part, it's also the income side of the equation. And we've got very ambitious plans uh, to increase the bottom line of the wholesale business over the next few years, which we've already started to demonstrate we can do. Uh, so, yeah, we, we want to see that cost income ratio getting towards 80%. Christopher, thanks for joining the program again. Uh, last time you were on the show, actually, you were speaking about your outlook for the Japanese yen, and at that point you were saying it could gain toward 140 by the end of the year. We are, of course, trending back toward closer to 160 at this point in time, but what's your outlook for the currency? Yeah, so look, forecasting's a dangerous thing to do, uh, especially on TV, but, uh, and I think uh, what we know is FX rates often do overshoot. Um, and clearly uh, we've seen some intervention to stabilize, uh, stabilize the yen. I still think that I don't have a major change to my view that in the medium term uh, there's no reason why the yen should, should, should not uh, strengthen from here. Uh, and the reasons for that are that we see uh, good momentum in the Japan economy. We see good inflows in terms of investment into Japan markets. Uh, and we do think that the, uh, that the interest rate differential with the U.S. is going to narrow. Uh, part of the reason I think we tested uh, the 160 level is obviously because a lot of the rate cut expectations in the U.S. have been priced out, which, by the way, we did also was one, was one of our forecasts earlier in, in the year. So it's come in line with our original forecasts. Um, but we do think ultimately the Fed is going to start to cut rates later in the year. Uh, we do think that, uh, that uh, the BOJ will do some limited tightening possibly uh, in October. So we see the interest rate differentials uh, narrowing. We see the fundamentals being relatively strong. And uh, we see that the international investors are still significantly underweight of the Japan market. So we would expect to see over the next year or so uh, inflows into Japan markets. So I would still say that our medium term view uh, would be that the yen goes uh, towards the 145, possibly 140 level. After that, I think it's much more uh, open to question because we don't know what the direction of policy will be. Uh, going forward in 2025. Uh, in the meantime, we probably are going to test 160. Markets tend to test these, these levels. Uh, uh, but I think we've seen some determination from the authorities here to, to uh, defend the yen. Uh, so, but my, my view is still unchanged. Uh, I still think that over time the yen is going to appreciate from here. Speaking of uh, Bank of Japan policy shifts, uh, how has the um, Japan fixed income business been performing since the BOJ uh, changed policy at the end of March? Uh, well, look, there's, there's, um, Japan fixed income is a much more interesting market when, uh, when you actually have uh, uh, interest rates or, or fixed income. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's been a very interesting time. I think that the level of interest in uh, Japan markets in general is higher, and that includes, uh, uh, includes the fixed income markets. Uh, I think uh, our expectation is that you know, inflation is going to stay uh, elevated. We're going to see some... Uh, uh, some higher, uh, some higher numbers in the Shunto. Um, so uh, we certainly think that uh, JGB yields can can possibly get to exceed one percent at some point, which will be the first time for a long time. So we think Japan fixed income markets are much more dynamic and interesting market than it has perhaps been for a right. few years. And with that, we've seen uh, that uh, yen rates traders have been in high demand. Um, there's a trend of hedge funds uh, hiring uh, those traders uh, for, as portfolio managers um, from banks. What's Nomura doing to attract and retain that sort of staff? Or is that even a priority for you guys? No, it, it's a priority for us to have uh, world-class uh, uh, traders and salespeople in our, in our businesses. Uh, undoubtedly, these markets are going to be more interesting, and undoubtedly, hedge funds will be um, looking for talent in the market. Um, I would say it's a double-edged sword for us. Our traders are very good, so they will be attractive to those people. But on the other hand, there are very few uh, places that have a, 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 a yen franchise as strong and powerful as ours. So if you are uh, one of those employees, Namura is probably the best place to be. Uh, so I think we'll be fine retaining that talent. I don't want to be complacent about it because very talented people are, are obviously very desirable. And it's my job to create a, a working environment that talented people want to be part of and, and want to stay in. So getting back to Investor Day, uh, you mentioned yesterday that uh, you want have a goal of becoming uh, one of the top 15 um, 
wealth managers in Asia. It's a very competitive space. Uh, how do you plan to go about achieving that? It is a very competitive space, but uh, the growth that we've shown, uh, you know, almost $6 billion of net new money over the last year, uh, we've doubled our uh, profitability uh, over the last year, um, and we're seeing very, very strong momentum. I think there's real appetite for uh, a Japanese wealth management company, or at least an Asian wealth management company. People would like an alternative to something American or something Swiss. Uh, and I think that the, capability, the global capabilities that we can bring to bear and the service levels that we can bring to bear are very competitive. So, yeah, we, we, we're aiming in the, in the short run. We've got a $35 billion target. It's, it's a relatively new business. We're going to go on to $60 billion from there. Uh, we've, we've hired incredibly talented people, uh, and uh, I, think, uh, I think the clients uh, really uh, believe in, in the offering and the brand that we bring to them. So... Uh, it's an ambitious target, but I actually have very little uh, doubt that we will succeed. Christopher Wilcox, thanks very much for your time today. Heidi, back to you. Uh, from Bex Russell Ward there. More on Australia's budget now. Goldman Sachs and RBC both saying that it's likely to result in the RBA keeping rates on hold for longer. Let's return to Canberra. Where our, uh, Paul Allen is with our next guest. Paul. Thanks very much, Heidi. Yes, I'm uh, here at Parliament House in Canberra with the Finance Minister, Katie Gallagher, to talk about the budget, which has just been handed down. And, uh, Minister, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. I want to start with the obvious question, which is regards inflation. There is obviously billions of dollars in spending in this budget. Economists are warning of the inflation risk. How do you tell them that they're not right? Well, for a start, economists have a range of views and it's always probably hard to find a group that agree with each other. But I think you need to look at the budget as a whole. So we're delivering the first back-to-back -back surpluses in 16 years. We're showing spending restraint, um, whether it be through savings or reprioritising across budget. We've, we've um, you know, put back all the revenue upgrades, the vast majority of those back to budget repair, lower debt, lower interest payments on that debt. Uh, so that tells the sort of budget responsibility, kind of looking to find restraint. But we've also had to work out ways to provide some cost of living relief without adding to inflation and have a view and an eye on the future. So this budget tries to do a lot of things, uh, but I certainly um, support the view that there is restraint in the budget. There's a lot of calls on the federal budget and we had to say no to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I want to return to the deficit question in a moment, but just on inflation, if you're correct, even if there is a, a short-term drop in inflation, Longer term, those pressures remain in place, don't they? Or what's, what's the plan to address that? Well, um, I think both the Reserve Bank and the Treasury see inflation moderating over the next 18 months, uh, continuing to moderate. I mean, when we came to government... We Inflation had a six in front of it. It's now got a three in front of it. We'd like a two in front of it. And um, that's what the Treasury forecasts show. And, you know, the decisions we've taken on whether it be medicines or rent assistance and the energy bill rebates um, focus on putting downward pressure on inflation over the next 12 months, which we think is a good outcome. Uh, but it also provides cost of living relief for households. In terms of the deficits, I mean, we had a couple of surpluses there. Um, but, of course, commodity prices are coming down. Do these deficits start to look a bit structural at the whims of you know, what else is going on in the global economy? Do you have the stomach for the really hard reform that might need to be done here? Well, there's, um, we've put our shoulder to the wheel on that since we came to government, looking to find savings. We've found $77 billion worth of savings or reprioritisations in the last three budget. That's a lot more than our predecessors did. And you're right, there's a lot more to do. Um, we need to look at reforms in NDIS. We're working on reforms in aged care. Defence are doing a lot of the heavy lifting in this budget in terms of looking at within their budget to find out how they make room for new priorities. And they're the big calls. The interest payments on our debt, we're lowering debt, so those interest payments are lower. They're the big structural pressures on the budget. They increase, they don't decrease, uh, but we need to reform in all of those areas. Well, certainly Australia's debt-to-GDP ratio will be the envy of many developed countries, but in terms of the savings. Let's look at the other side of the coin, the spending. You've delivered the cost of living relief, as you say, uh, tax breaks for all Australians as well. Was there not a sense that maybe those really high income earners don't need this? Could there, could there have been more of a saving made? 
Well, I think if you're talking about energy bill relief, I mean, our cost of living package, there are elements that are targeted, as we've done in the past, so uh, the rent assistance and medicines, looking at how we can provide that over five years to concession card holders. But the most efficient and easiest way to deliver a short-term cost of living relief on energy bills, on electricity bills, is, um, you know, the minute you move outside of the concessions regime is to allow it to be broad-based. Uh, in terms of some of the tax incentives, particularly around the future made in Australia, this was obviously a, a centrepiece of the budget. Critical minerals, hydrogen, those tax breaks don't start until 2028. Can you explain the reason for the delay? Why not now? So the future made in Australia, you're right, is a big part of the budget. An element of that is renewable energy superpower, um, and that has kind of the... the production tax credit system that we want to put in place. The reason they don't start till 2027 um, is because it's around production. So, you know, people need to make the investment, actually start producing green hydrogen, refining and um, processing the crit critical minerals before they can get a tax benefit from that. So there is a couple of years there uh, on that. But in the meantime, we're also looking at a range of grants, um, equity, loans. We've got our National Reconstruction Fund working. So there there is intervention and support from the government in the short term as well. Now, is this the last budget before we see an election or is there going to be one more? Well, the Prime Minister's um, outlined that there'll be a budget in March. We have to have an election by May, but ultimately that decision's for the Prime Minister, above my pay grade. OK, I'm, I was anticipating that kind of uh, response. <laughs> oh, no. um, uh, there is, though, a risk for you, isn't there, heading into that election, returning to deficit. I, I know the Labor government's been trying to position itself as responsible economic managers. Have you left your flank open to an attack uh, with this deficit that you're forecasting for 2024-25? I think we've been open with people and honest about the pressures on the budget since we came to government. Like, we have worked hard to deliver those surpluses. They don't happen by accident. I know people, there's a bit of commentary around that they just happen. They don't. I mean, there's no shortage of calls for spending on the budget. We've had to say no to a lot of things. We want um, those surpluses. They help with inflation in the short term. Uh, but I'm not going to pretend that there aren't increasing pressures. NDIS, aged care, health the defence and interest on government debt are the five key structural pressures on the budget that we need to continue to work on in reform. All right, Finance Minister Katie Gallagher, thank you so much for joining us. All right, uh, we will leave it there. The, government, the budget back in surplus, but only for a few weeks, 2024-25, we'll see the return of deficits. Back to you. We make news is Paul Allen there in Canberra. Coming up in the next hour, Australian Shadow Treasurer Angus Taylor joins us live from Canberra for the opposition's view on the federal budget. Also, Singapore's economic future in focus today, the city-state's fourth prime minister to be sworn in. Uh, we do have some breaking news when it comes to leadership changes at Petrobras. Uh, we are hearing that President uh, Lula there has informed the president of Petrobras, Jean-Paul Prates, that he is out of the company. This, of course, comes after extended period of really disputes and uh, tension at Petrobras between uh, that uh, state-controlled oil giant and the and the broader government. We've seen uh, really about a month ago the sort of settling down of some of these simmering tensions as an internal government battle over the company's chief executive. Uh, we had the dispute really over the top job inside Lula's administration, causing Petrobras shares at one point to swing pretty wildly. There were reports and rumours that he would soon be fired and that has actually eventuated after what has been really a few weeks of calm for the CEO of Petrobras. We uh, are now hearing that uh, Magda Chambriard uh, will be the new president of Petrobras. She was formerly the general director of the National Petroleum Agency during the Rousseff government. So we'll be bringing you uh, more details, of course. The former CEO now had been under fire uh, who wanted him to uh, bring down fuel prices and create a job creating investments. The market opens in Sydney and Tokyo are next. This is Bloomberg.